We began this study last Wednesday night answering the tough questions that are asked of our faith and are asked the tough questions of life that we ask. And it's my desire this will be a real help to us and not only for our own personal lives but being a witness to the world around us. How many knows the world around us almost speaks a different language when it comes to things like God and faith and they're asking questions like never before. Let's pause and pray before we begin tonight. Father, I pray that we'll leave here, God, with a new sense of how majestic that you really are, how great, how mighty, how tremendous. Lord, that you're our maker. You're our creator, Lord. So, Lord, we come before you tonight, God, that made the heavens above and the earth beneath and the seas and all that in them is. We desire by your spirit that we gain just a renewed appreciation of having a creator and bowing our hearts to him in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. We begin the series, How to Apologize. The topic is apologetics. That's a big word that simply means giving the reason, giving the defense, the reason of our hope to those that ask. Personally, this will help us to know why, the why of what we believe. Many times you'll ask someone, what, what do you believe? And they can answer that, but then when you follow that up with, why do you believe that? That is another situation. Our scripture is this. Peter's admonition is to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so we are admonished to be ready to give an answer. And that's what this series is all about. Last Wednesday night, we began with the question, does God exist? I said that the world asks it this way. They ask, how can you Christians, how can you believers believe God exists when it's unintelligent to believe so? What we learned last week, it's not unintelligent to believe in God. It's unintelligent not to believe in God. In fact, we're going to find tonight that most people don't have intellectual problems with God. Most people have moral problems with God. They, in other words, they don't believe not because of intellectual barriers, but they don't believe because of moral barriers. But we pretty much talked about that last not uh, last week tonight we're going to talk about another way the world asks this question how can you believe god exists when evolution has been proved and right away we as christians we're doing what wait 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 evolution hasn't been proved I'm not going to take this tack tonight, but when, whenever I hear, hear him say something like that, I, I think of several things. First of all, I think of simply this. It's a lie. They claim in textbooks, they, the authorities claim, claim in college that the data supports evolution. But the reality is there's far more data to debunk evolution than there is to prove it. One example, even by their own estimates... The world hasn't been around near long enough for evolution to take place. By their own estimations, the world hasn't been here long enough for the process of evolution to take place. Not only do I think of the lie, I think, whoops. <laughs> By that, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I always read the science uh, section in the newspaper. How many realize, and I'm sure the same thing is on television, how many realize the number of times the report begins like this? Scientists thought it was this many years old, but now they have discovered that they were wrong and it was actually this many years old. Or they, they expected to see this in this part of the galaxy. Instead, they saw something completely different. Or they thought this animal was a herbivore, but they found out that it was a carnivore. How many have noticed those times where they're always saying, we messed up, it wasn't that way at all, we're going to have to change this. They're always the whoops with the uh, evolution and then there's the make it up as you go whenever I, I hear him talking about how evolution has been proved I think of how they make things up as they go now I don't want to bore you with this but 
There is such a number of stars in the sky, according to their theory, in the age of the earth, that when you go out at night, when you look up at the sky, it ought to appear that one star is butting up against another. The whole sky ought to be nothing but one star beside the other, according to their theory. We know it's not that way. We know there's big gaps, well, as you can see in the background. That's the way it is. And so they say, now, our theory says that their stars ought to be butting up against each other. So out of the blue, they develop something called dark matter to block the light of these other stars. And the reason we don't see the other stars is because this dark matter gets in the way. In other words, they had to make up something because what we observed did not fit their theory. So they make it up as they go. And one more thing, and we'll move forward to our, our, our time tonight. When they say they've proved evolution, I always think this way. They say scientists have proved it, but the evolutionary theory violates the whole definition of science. Science, by definition, deals with things that can be observed and repeated and verified. They have not observed evolution take place. They've not been able to repeat it. And there's no way they verified it. Therefore, it does not fit the definition of science. It's a hypothesis. But see, we're going to try not just to disprove this tonight. We're going to try to give an answer of what we believe in the place of evolution. We're going to start with the very first verse of the Bible. Here's what we believe. How many would, would attest this is what we believe? Not evolution, but we believe in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. God created. In the Gospel of John, verse, first verse, it says, In the beginning was... Now, this is so important. You know, we, we, we quote this, we read this, but we don't stop and think. Tonight, we're going to understand this word like never before. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Who? All things were made by the God or... The Word. The Word was God. This, the Word was in the beginning with God. All things were made by the Word. And without Him, the Word was not anything made that was made. The Word made these things. Genesis said He made, God made the heaven and the earth. Everything of this universe is made of atoms. God made it. God made every planet, every star of our universe. God made the planet Earth. God made all the plants that are on Earth. God made all the animals. And God made humans. <coughs> but I want you to notice when we say the phrase, God made. Listen to what we're saying. We're saying a person, a person created everything. One of the things that distinguishes people from rocks is intelligence. When we say God created all, we're saying a person created all. What we're saying, everything that is began with an intelligent being. Someone with intelligence. The Word, the Word was made flesh. The Word made it all. Jesus is God. He is the Word. And the Word for Word. Is literally logos. How many knows the word we get from this? Logic. In other words, the ability to reason and to speak that. So the word is literally, to have a word, you have to have intelligence and information. Everything that is in this universe began with the intelligence and information of God. The word made all things. You know, there's a lot of different reasons not to believe in evolution. But the one we're going to focus on is that the universe as we see it could have only begun with intelligence. The universe as we see it could only have begun with information. Now, the evolutionists would say, no, it didn't begin with intelligence. Everything you see is a product of time plus chance. Now, I want to tell you, I, I, I've got to get with it here tonight, but I want to tell you something. When you tell people that everything, including 
themselves were began with time plus chance. You know what you just told them? You've told them they're nothing more than an accident. We are a, every one of us, according to evolution, is a cosmic accident. We just happen to be here. I want to tell you, I like it better God created because I'm not an accident. I'm a product of the handiwork of God. How many of us we are fearfully and wonderfully made? No wonder we got the problems in our society. Evolutionists taught them from the schools up to the universities that they're nothing more than a chemical accident. Just something that happened over time plus chance. Now, you know we can't respond to everything about evolution, the beginning of the universe, so we're going to, we're going to respond to one thing tonight, and that's the beginning of life. The most basic, smallest, Building block of life is a cell. I think this is a yeast cell, but we talk about skin cells and bone cells. The smallest unit of anything that is living and the smallest thing that is alive is a single cell. We're going to show tonight that evolution could not, could not have resulted in this living cell. But as the Bible says, only an intelligent being, God, could have been responsible for the origin and the beginning of a single cell. You know, we like to focus sometimes on the ridiculousness of evolution in that we came from monkeys. I mean, usually when you hear someone saying something about evolution, they remark how silly it is that we came from monkeys. Now, I'll give you that's pretty silly. But there's something a lot more difficult than getting from a monkey to a man. In fact, sometimes you don't have to go too far. But we act like that's the big jump. The big jump isn't going from an ape to a man. The big jump is trying to, to explain how does life come from non-life? How do you move from inanimate, lifeless substances to a living thing? There is where the evolutionists have their trouble. How do you go from a rock to a living cell to a human being? I mean, I mean, I, I think most of us are aware there's a big gulf between a pile of rocks and a living, breathing human being, or a flower, or a one cell yeast cell. Now, if, if you'll stay with me just a minute, we'll bring this together. But I, I want us to stop and think very simply. For something to come into being, I mean, we, we can look around in this, in this building. We can see all kinds of things. We can see a piano. We can see a pew. We can see a communion table. We can see a light figure. We can see people. But for something to come into being, it takes these things. First of all, there must be materials to make the thing. I, I didn't re download to get the details of it, but I'll say enough to remind you. There was a little story going out about five years ago about this man. He, he, he thought he got so intelligent he could do whatever God could do, so he challenged God. He said, God, I'll tell you what. I know you made man out of clay and breathed in him, made him a living soul, but I, man, I can make life too. I can make a living man too. Just watch me. God said, okay, I'll take your challenge. God told the man, you go first. The man said, okay, watch this. I can do it. And the man scooped down and got a handful of clay getting ready to mold it. And God said, hold it. Wait a minute. You've already cheated. You've got to go get your own clay. You have to have something, a material to make something from. And then the second thing is need. Those materials must be in the same place. The third thing is those materials must be in the right place. And then the fourth thing is, the items of the material must be in the right position in proximity to each other. Have you ever put something together and not looked at the directions and you thought you had it put together and you had pieces left over? And you had to take everything apart to put those pieces back in. See, to have something, whatever it is, piano, whatever, each piece has to be in its right position in relationship to every other piece. Now, I'm going to give you an example, first of all, of a house. For there to be a house... It had to have these things. First of all, again, there must be the materials to make the thing. There had to be trees to get the two-by-fours from. There had to be rocks to build the chimney. There had to be a clay pit to get the tiles for the roof. There had to be sand to make the glass. You had to have materials to make that thing the house. The second thing is those materials must be in the same place. 
If you were getting ready to build a house, you couldn't have your two-by-fours in Florida and your tile in Oklahoma and your glass in Ohio and et cetera, et cetera. You've got to have your building supplies there at the site if that thing is going to be put together, if it's going to be constructed. The third thing is those materials must not be in this, only in the same place. They must be in the right place. There are places you can't build a house. You can't build a house on a glacier. You can't build a house on a cloud. You can't build a house on the waves. You can't build a house under the water. You have to have the right location to build a house. And then you got the material there. You're at the, the, you got it at the same place. You got it at the right place. Then you've got to put those materials together in the right position in proximity to one another. How many have seen someone try to build a house and they weren't putting each place, uh, piece in the place it ought to be? Have you seen that? If you're going to have a house, Brother Brock, each piece has to be in its right position. Now, I, I shared that with you because we're going to talk about, not ooh, I'll get back to that, not just a house, but that living cell. How do you go from the non-life of a rock to a living cell? Now, the next picture coming up was Darwin's explanation of that. He said, sure, you can have life from non-life. And to illustrate that, he took a piece of meat, put it out in the sun. He said, would everyone agree this meat's not alive? He put it out in the sun, and a few hours or days or whatever later, it was crawling with maggots. This isn't Sunday morning. We can take this picture right now. And so Darwin said, see... The life of the maggot came from the dead flesh. But he was way behind on the science, or had, the science hadn't got there yet. We know that the, the, the life of the maggot didn't come from the dead meat. We know that that thing was infested with living eggs. And so that, I mean, I mean that's the one we get our theory from of evolution. This was the explanation of how you, get, how you could get life from non-life. Here's what evolutionists say. There was a time when there was nothing on earth, no plants, no animals, no life. There was just rocks. There was this, they call it a soup. It was just a chemical, some kind of chemical liquid. And the atmosphere was ammonia. And the atmosphere was methane. And this is what they say that life came out of. The living cell, and then ultimately you and I came out of this soup. This soup. That's where the living cell, they say, came from. How did it come from that? You know, you can say that the living cell came from this chemical soup, but then you've got to answer the question, how did it come? Well, you know what? When you, when you boil it all down, the only thing they can tell you, if you have lots of time, and then just by chance, this is what the world puts their faith in. They can give you no answer how life came from that lifeless chemical soup other than to say, well, if you have lots of time, then there is at least one chance that life could come from a non-living soup. But we're going to take, we're going to take and play Scrabble. How many like to play Scrabble? Okay. Someone help me here. Let's see. Who, who'd like to help me? Who'd like to help me? Hmm. Chris, come help me. Would you do that? Now, what I want you to do can, can you read this from back there? I did this today. By the way, I'm already illustrating. How many believes, this is our, our cabinet here, how many believes I just poured these out of the bag and ended up with that? Does anyone believe that? If I told you that, would you believe me? Why do people believe in evolution? We're going to see that's what they believe in. They believe that the acids were poured out of the bag, so to speak, and there it happened. There was life. No, I had to put those. But I want you to try it, at least illustrate. Don't Make sure they don't bounce off. I want you to pour these Scrabble tiles out and stay close and see if it's going to end up with this, with this uh, sequence here of letters. How many believes it's going to happen when he pours the Scrabble tiles? How many believes he's going to get this? If he does, I'm running out of here. I ain't staying around. <laughs> Did you get it? Can you read it back there? God created all there is. By the way, has, any, has anyone counted how many those letters there? Have you counted them yet? There better be 20. I counted them. 20, okay. How many believes if we gave him another chance and he poured them out, he'd get that? 
Maybe if he left them there for 10 years and came back, they would, they would read this way all on their own. How many, how many believe if he did it a million times? No one? We got a lot of unbelievers here, and you, Chris, they just don't believe in you. He's figuring his next move. What if we did it a billion times? What if, we, what if Chris poured the tiles out as many times as our national debt? Maybe then. That's a lot of times. It's just, you maybe want to sit down there for just a minute. Now remember, to have something, you have to have the material. To have a living cell, it takes amino acids. So we're going to use the illustration, it takes Scrabble tiles. But to have a living cell, you must have 20 that separate from the other 80. Now I know there's 100 Scrabble tiles but what would have to happen, he poured out, let's say there's 80, he poured out these 80. And remember that little phrase I had up there, God created all things? What would have to happen is the right 20 out of the 80, the right 20 tiles would have to, on their own, separate themselves. I'm talking about what evolutionists believe. Those 20 tiles would have to separate themselves all on their own from the other 80. Well, that would leave 60, but you see what I'm saying? Those, those particular, those specific 20 would just have to separate themselves. The next thing it would take to have, there I showed that happening. The next thing that would have to happen to have a living cell is each of those 20 must be left-handed acids. Now, many of you that work with screws and nuts and bolts, you know you have right hand and left hand. Have you ever tried to screw a right hand bolt and a left hand nut? How, how well does that work? Okay. Now, let's use the Scrabble tiles to explain that. If you're going to play Scrabble, you can't have this. So in, in our illustration, some of these are left hand and some of these are right hand. We can't spell my little message because some of the tiles aren't turned over the right direction. So not only do you have to have the right 20 amino acids, you have to have them all the left hand. By the way, no right hand amino acids create life. You'll sleep better tonight knowing this. It takes left handed amino acids to create a living cell. So what we'd have to do next, Chris, and I'm not going to have you do it now, but you'd have to have all these, not only the right 20, you'd have to have them all turned over in the same direction. Then those 20 must be put in the right order or sequence to produce a protein molecule. So we're going from acid to molecule. I know this is a little bit of science, but with our illustration, we'll see how ludicrous it is. You've got the right 20. Somehow those 20 that it takes to create this message, they separate from the 80. They're all turned in the right direction. But now they, to, to, to be that thing, that message, they've got to be in the right sequence. Now, again, I did this. I'm illustrating as I go here. It took intelligence. Okay. You just trust me, right? You'll trust me. It took intelligence to take, separate those 20 tiles and then to put them in the right sequence. I could have never had this message if I hadn't put the letters in the right sequence. You cannot have a living cell if those amino acids, those 20, are not put in the right sequence. Now, here's something that most people won't tell you, but it's, it's really interesting to me. Not only do you have to have the right 20, but when you are putting them in sequence, go ahead and act like you got the right 20 and you're putting them in sequence. As you're putting them in sequence, you've got to make sure another molecule doesn't come along and steal one of those. Okay, Nathan, you be another molecule. He's putting them in sequence. Okay. And he's a molecule, and he thinks he about has it, and this molecule steals some of those acids. That's what happens. Those acids, 20 acids, would have been totally had to be left alone in a place where there's no other molecules or those other... Look, look he just keeps stealing them. How difficult is it going to be to write that message? Okay, thank you, other molecules. Did he make a good molecule? Okay, don't steal them. And then those 20... It's right there, Chris, we're not quite... Okay. Once they're in the right sequence, they've got to be bonded with just the exact right chemical bond. Okay, I use tape. That's my, going to be my chemical bond. And once they're bonded, they have to be lifted up and formed into a three-dimensional cell. Now, we're still not to life. We still haven't got to life. It takes a hundred of these. 
uh, hundreds of these put together to form just one protein molecule, but we still don't have life. It's still not a living cell because you'll have to have 200 of these molecules made up of 100 of these acids to form one living cell. I want to tell you something evolutionists don't want you to know. It takes more information and more complexity to make one simple living cell than is found in the, the, the fastest supercomputer that man has created. Think about that. I'm going to say it one more time. It takes more information and it takes more complexity to make one single living cell than it does that then is found in the fastest of the most complex supercomputers that man has constructed. I'm telling you, it didn't just happen. Thank you, Brother Chris. So we have our living cell. Now again, the evolution says this all happened with time plus chance. So how do you go from the soup to the living cell? Here's their best explanation. They say you had this lifeless chemical soup and lightning hit it. And that caused those 20 tiles to separate and start to come together. They thought they proved this. I don't want to get too detailed. I'm not qualified to get too detailed. But I just want to give you this one illustration. They thought they saw this because they did an experiment. They took uh, 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 ammonia and methane gas and put those chemicals together and, and, and ch uh, sent electrical charge to it. And it formed this real rudimentary uh, piece of protein. And they said, see, it could have happened. There's only one problem with that. By their own information. The atmosphere of the world where this took place at that time would not have been ammonia and methane. It would have been carbon dioxide and nitrogen. And if you put electrical charge and carbon dioxide carbon dioxide and nitrogen it won't do this it only does it with ammonia and then it's so simple and it falls apart and it doesn't do anything so they're just grasping at straws. Here's the chances of all this happening. 1 in 10 with 60 zeros after it. Now the thing that's interesting with that, the odds of evolution or this life come from non-life, the odds are greater than there are atoms in the universe. Now we don't play the lottery, right? But that's like, well I'm a little worried now, let's, let's back up. For, now we don't play the lottery, do we? Okay. It's still a little weak, but. But that's like me telling you to win the lottery, your odds are one in a hundred thousand, but there's only there's only a hundred tickets sold. In other words, your odds are greater, or actually there would be less, less than there are even tickets. There's not even enough atoms to meet each of the odds. One person said, this was a mathematician that figured this out, for this to happen, as, as we recounted tonight, for life to come to, from non-life, would be like taking one grain of sand, letting it loose in the middle of the Sahara Desert, and then sending a person to find that one particular marked grain of sand in all the Sahara Desert. And if he did, he'd have to do it two more times, to have the same odds of this process I explained to you tonight ever happening on its own. How many believe a person could do that three different tries every time find the marked grain of sand in the middle of the Sahara Desert? One man said it would be like if a tornado went through a junkyard and once that tornado passed through the junkyard it took all those different pieces in the junkyard put them together in the midst of its, its, its vortex there, and out flew a 747. I mean, those are the odds. This is what it would take for life to come from not, not life. Now, how many believe that would ever happen? My grandfather had a junkyard. I can't imagine a tornado going through that in a 747. But the real problem that they have with this, let me go back right, right here for just a moment. Is this can happen in a slow process. 
To have life, you've got to have all of the pieces at once. Now, how many could, could believe that just the body of the airplane could fly through the air? No. What about if it had the body and just the tail? No. The body and the tail and just one wing? No, it takes the whole of the airplane to fly. And so one person said the only way life could come from non-life is if that airplane was put together in the air and flying the whole time. See, it, it, it can't happen slowly. It's all the pieces have to be there at the same time. Let me give you a little problem with this. You know, you, 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 how many knows what this is? A penguin, right? What would you think it would be closer related to, a duck or a chicken? I already showed you the picture. I ruined it. It's a lot closer related genetically to a chicken. So if you went back far enough, they had a great, 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 great grandfather. They had the same one. Now, evolutionists have you believe that this chicken, this land animal, became the creature that's a penguin that swims in the ocean. But how did that happen slowly? I mean, how did that rooster go, Ooh. One foot in, one foot, yeah. I mean, how that, you know, the, the, you know, all that stuff, the webbing of the feet, you know, the, 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 how, I mean, how did that happen slowly? It couldn't. He would have drowned before he became the penguin. Another example they like to give of evolution that works against them is there's a certain duck, this is a duck in Mexico, that literally roosts in trees, and it does so to survive. And they say what happened is it used to make its, its nest on the ground, but it was getting killed off, so it mutated, it changed, and began to build its nest up in the tree. But wait a minute. If that happened slowly, how would that happen? Did he build his nest, you know, an inch higher, then another inch, and then ten inches? He would have been killed off where he ever got his nest on the top of the tree where he was safe. And so the thing is this happens to ha has to happen at once. I believe it did. God said, let there be light. There was light. God created the animals on one day. Amen. So let's go back and quickly review. We'll put it together and we'll be done. There's got to be materials to make a thing. The materials must be in the same place. The materials must be in the right place. And the materials must be in the right position with one another. We gave you the example of the house. You've got to have the materials. They've got to be in the same place. They've got to be in the right place. And they've got to be in the right position. But it takes one more thing for this to happen. If you have all the materials in the right place and all that, what more does it take? It takes intelligence. It takes the mind of a man that has the plan and has the intellectual ability to know where to put the pieces. No one believes a house comes into existence by time plus chance. They know it takes intelligence. It takes information. Well, the evolutionists said, well, you know, you're talking about it takes patterns. It, it takes some kind of, and they say, here's an example of how without intelligence, there are patterns in the universe. And they give the example how the waves of the sea as they ebb and flow, they'll make these markings on the beach. And they say, look, look how symmetrical that is. And that was made without intelligence. Well, let me ask you, how many can tell a difference of the, this pattern made by the rhythmic waves of the tide compared to this in the sand. Now, I know that wouldn't have to be made by intelligence. It's made by the ways. But when you see that, you immediately say, somebody with intelligence, at least a little bit, somebody with intelligence wrote, how many of you saw that would believe the tide came in, and when the tide went out, the tide made that message? You know why you believe there's intelligence behind it? Because it conveys information. However basic of information that is, however simplistic, when you see this in the sand, you know that that wasn't the waves that did it. You know intelligence had to be behind it because it conveyed information. So let's go back. Let's go back to the cell. Okay? There is something that it takes to have that living cell. How many knows what this is? Anyone know? DNA. DNA is information. If you see DNA 
you know it's not waves or, or the pattern created by waves. When the scientist sees DNA, he is looking at information. And what does it take to have information? It takes intelligence. If it conveys information, intelligence had to write it there. So let's go through this quickly. To have a living cell, you've got to have amino acids. You've got to have the right 20 out of the 80. Those 20 all must be left-handed. They've got to be in the right sequence. They've got to be put together with the right chemical bond. They've got to be formed into three dimensions. You've got to have 100 of those to form a protein molecule. You've got to have 200 you got to have 200 protein molecules to form a living cell. But it takes one more thing. It takes the information to tell those tiles to do all that. Okay? Just like you would agree, however limited it was for me to have that message up there with the scrabble tiles, it took my intelligence to guide that process. Well, the cell has that. It's the DNA. But who put the DNA in the cell? Just like you see, I love you in the sand, you said intelligence is behind that. When you see the information in the DNA, you have to conclude intelligence put it there. Now what does it mean now when it says the Word created all things? Jesus is the Word. He is the intelligence that put the information in the DNA to produce life. When you look at the language of a DNA, God wrote that. We use 26 letters to form uh, messages with our intelligence. God used four in DNA. You can see them there, C-A-G and T. Everything that DNA says... Do you know how long it took them to map the, G, the DNA? How many kept track of that when it was in the news? Years and years with supercomputers to map the message of a DNA. And it was all made by four letters. In fact, you can see them here. They're, they're represented here with the different colors. One, two, three, four. That message of the DNA letters, that information was put there by the intelligence of God. You say four letters, that's not as many as 26. How many is impressed what a computer can do? And I know they're numbers, but how many characters does a computer use for all its? Just two. Zero, one. Would you come, music? I don't believe it was time plus chance. I believe it was the Word of God. Hallelujah. He is the intelligence that put the information that created life. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, I do not recommend you going out and find an evolutionist tomorrow and say, you fool. Remember how we're to give an answer with what? Meekness and fear, right? But what does the Scripture say? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He's not a fool because he doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in God because he's a fool. You see, a fool in the Bible isn't someone that's lacking in intelligence. It's somebody that ought to know what's right. It's somebody that has made the wrong moral decision. You know, you can share some of the things that we shared tonight and people that don't believe in God say, well, I know it's what you share has got to be right, but I'm still not going to believe in God. You know why they say that? Because it's not a matter of their mind. It's a matter of their heart. The fool has said in his heart. You know, I, it's been a couple years ago, but it just struck me one time. He's not a fool because he said there's no God. He's a fool because he said it in his heart. He didn't get up in front of a crowd and say, I want you to know there's no God, and therefore he's a fool. He's a fool because he said it in his heart. He told himself there is no God. That's a fool when you tell yourself there is no God. And there's a lot of things we could deal with there, but one of the things is that he knows better. He knows there's got to be a God. And he's a fool that he overrides that, and he tells himself, no, you don't believe there is God.
I'm not going to open another discussion, but I'll tell you one reason he's a fool. Because, you know, everything we see was either created by God or ultimately it came from nothing. Right? And so he's a fool because if he believes in evolution, then there is no evidence for God and he's alone in this universe. I want you to think about that. If we believe there's evolution, we believe there's no God, and I know there's variations of that, but if you push it to its logical conclusion, if you really believe in evolution, there's no God. And if there's no God, we're, at, we're alone in this universe. Most of us don't even like being left alone in our own house. Can you think what it must be to be alone in this universe without God? Only a fool would want to believe that. I'm glad we're not alone. I'm glad we have a creator. Hallelujah. And he's not an idea. He's an, he's an intelligence. Hallelujah. He's a fool because if evolution's true, there's no God, we're alone. But if evolution's true, there's no life after death. The only trouble is if you can come up a way to get life out of non-life and you don't need God, then there's no life after death. I promise you that. Jesus said the only reason we're going to live is because He lives. He's God. But I'm telling you, I believe God created me. And He didn't just create a body. He created an eternal soul. And because there is a God, this life isn't all there is to it. I'm telling you, if this life is all there is to it, we're no, better, we're, we're no different than a leech or a rock. But because we're created in the image of God, I mean, we have value and we don't end when we quit breathing this body, we live on and on. There's life after death. It's a fool that doesn't want to believe there's life after death. And if evolution's true, then there's no basis from distinguishing between right and wrong. You know, they could try to come up things, but I'm going to tell you, if evolution's true, there's no way they can tell you it's right or wrong to do anything. And then you wonder why we have no morality in our society. Teach folks evolution. Who's to judge what's right and wrong? But if there's a creator, he has every right to tell his creation what is right, what is wrong. How many really wants to live in a society, a world, where there's no right or wrong? In fact, they do worse than that. No one can they not tell right from wrong. They call wrong right and right wrong. The fool. And then, if evolution's true, he's a fool. Because there is absolutely no meaning in life. We're just accidents. We're just something that happened to happen. There's no meaning in life. But I want to tell you, if God created me, then what I do matters. What I say matters. What I think matters. I've got a purpose for living. If I'm an accident that came out of that suit by chance, I don't have any purpose or reason. But if I've been created... I've got a purpose and a reason for a living. Hallelujah. And that's to worship and to please and to honor my Creator. Oh, hallelujah. I don't want to be a fool. I know you don't. I know I'm preaching to the choir. Oh, but somehow get a hold of folks and say, Look, amen. If you just believe in God, don't you realize what that means? I'm going to close with this. I didn't know exactly how I was going to close, but. Just read just a little bit of a psalm to you. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King among all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is His also. Listen, the sea is His. He made it. And His hands formed the dry land. He didn't just make the sea and the land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Isn't that wonderful? I'm not an accident. I worship my Creator tonight on a Wednesday night. Therefore, I've got meaning. I've got purpose. Oh, we need God. You know, would you stand? But as I was praying over this in the prayer room, I found my, myself singing, I, I need Thee. 
Every hour I need Thee. That's why I'm glad I've got a Creator because I need a Creator. I need a Helper. I need an Almighty God. Oh, hallelujah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Hallelujah. And He came that we could have that life. Oh, let's worship Him across the earth. Let's just bow in our hearts before our Maker. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We worship You. Oh, hallelujah. If you're here tonight and you're not living for your Maker, you've lost purpose and meaning. You have no direction. But if you would come tonight and say, Oh, God, I acknowledge You as my Creator. I surrender my life to you as my creator. You'd also discover that not only is he creator, he's a great redeemer. He knows we've been marred and marked by sin after he created us. So he sent Jesus to redeem us and bring us back from sin and give us hope. Amen. If you're here tonight without God, in the sense you've not surrendered your life to him, if you do that tonight, you can know the purpose and the reason for living. Amen. I want to invite you. Would you come? Let's come bow before our Maker tonight and worship Him. Would you do that? Hallelujah. Everyone that believes that you've been created by God, come and bow before your Maker and worship Him and praise Him and honor Him. Hallelujah. God, you made the heavens above and the earth beneath and the seas and all that in them is. And Lord, you made me. You made us, Lord. Hallelujah. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture created in your image. Hallelujah.